Hello and welcome back to Conversations with Claire. Today's episode is with Matt Williams. Do you like to go by Matt or Matthew? Either way. Usually getting yelled at is Matthew Warren Williams. But that's been a long time. So Okay, so Matt it is. That's perfect. <laughs> Unless you piss me off. I was I'm aiming to not do that. <laughs> I always was told I'm either like really good or I'm not good. Like there's no in between. Thankfully I'm good most, like I'm, I'm good a lot. So that's cool. That is, that's a, that's probably like the aim of most things is to be good at all times. But yeah. Yeah. We, we definitely have histories where that's not a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What addiction? What? We'll mm -hmm. get into that. Okay. So Matt is the founder of Fro Pro. Pro Pro yep. Snack Bars. He is, was a former teacher. Mm -hmm. In public and private schools. Correct. Can you tell that I did my homework? I, I'm impressed. I'm going to keep I've going. I've been on podcasts and I've never had this level of already detail going into it. I'm not done. <laughs> you were an admissions counselor at a recovery center for drugs and alcohol. Correct. You were a coach at a fitness facility. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like maybe you still are. Still dabble in that, yeah. All right. And you are a current coach at Next Level Recovery Association? Associates, yeah. Associates. So, it's just next level. Okay. So, Got it. so that's Matt in a nutshell. So hello, Matt, and thank you for saying yes to being on the pod. Super pumped to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm just glad to get some time with you as well. And I know how, how busy you are and what, what you have going on. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, it's a, I think it's such a cool thing when you do get so busy, how people start to regard your time in a way that's like, just a blessing like I, you know because i get that now of like i know you're busy and I'm like yeah but i like you, you matter you know and and how cool is that that i don't know i just have to acknowledge that that's a pretty cool thing to get to hear and then be like yeah you still do the things that are really important to you and when you're busy you you fill your calendar you got time yeah <laughs> no, and that's the thing it's like when you visit someone's hometown we were talking about before the show it's like everybody has a routine especially during the week and even in the weekend and it's mm. Hey, if there's time, great. If there's not, no hard feelings, no resentments. I'll see you or catch you the next time. Mm -hmm. And I used to not be that way. I used to be like, I'm fucking in town. Like, uh, like, why aren't we hanging out? But now it's just, I have my meetings and I have some things set up and mm -hmm. uh, have some time to actually do this, which I really appreciate. Yeah, yeah. So you are visiting Austin, Texas, but yep. you live in Boca Raton, right? Florida? Correct. Yeah. I like saying South Florida because anytime you say Boca, everyone's like, oh, so you live in like God's waiting ground, the old people place. I'm like, it's yes, there are old people there, <laughs> but it is a lot younger. And with the mass exodus from the Northeast down to Florida or Texas or coming from the West, I mean, there, are, there's a lot of people there now. Okay. I mean, it's a lot younger than uh, it used to be. Move your mic up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's, it's gentrifying as they may say. Good, yeah. We'll go with that word. It works. It works. <laughs> there was a little bit of discomfort with that one. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, a lot of a lot of how like the small beach town Delray, Boca used to be. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things changing. So it's not like a like it's becoming more commercialized. And again, I've only been there 13 years, I want to say. Um, but a lot has changed uh, and, and some for the good and not and some for so much yeah um and there is a, a definite um i mean like i think there is here in terms of like recovery and sobriety there's a lot of um, pushback but also like a welcoming thing uh -huh. at the same time if uh -huh. that makes sense there's like a push pull for yeah that whole thing because a lot of the places that operate on the ave and the places where people like to go and visit sure are worked by people that are like starting over or transients mm -hmm. living situations mm -hmm. so yeah. Yeah. This is the first move that I've made location wise in sobriety or I mean, ever moving out of my hometown uh, or out of my home state. Sorry. So all I knew, I certainly have come to Austin many years in the past to have a grand old time. Sure. And so those were my experiences here before. And then once I moved here, I was fully, you know, a year plus in, in recovery. And so then it was, I, sought out a community for that and it was very easy to find and there's a lot of it around here and, and it's crazy you say that because it's like it's always been there and it's like once your eyes open to it and you're yeah. like wait this has been here the whole time that was my experience in florida and i was like oh you can like trip over a fellowship meeting or you can trip over a community of people that are living a different way and and, and in a sober lifestyle and you're like man this has been here mm -hmm. and like thank god for that mm -hmm. there's a lot of places like again i know texas is huge on it or you know austin area like you know 
California, Florida, there's certain pockets around the country where it's like super saturated in the best possible way for recovery. Mm -hmm. And the experience that you can have versus like being isolated in the middle of some state where there's not, and it's like, I have to drive an hour to connect with somebody. Yeah. It makes it a little bit more difficult from just kind of my knowledge of working or meeting people that are like, man, I can't believe you can literally trip over something here. And yeah. Like find some form of recovery or some form of community yeah. that you can connect with. Yeah. I think uh, definitely thanks to COVID and all of its cute little blessings. Joking, joking. Um, I have to now just say that one of my clients currently she calls it the panini that she calls the pandemic the panini she refers to right. and i just like i she makes me laugh yeah <laughs> and she doesn't can't. love to laugh she's like oh yeah during the panini blah 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 blah. and yep. i'm like oh <laughs> okay you got to put a positive spin on it she's so funny um anyway but where i lived before there were a couple of options which is great and that's i mean i just the, the first place i went was the place that was you know where were, where did you live i, I lived in oklahoma that's right okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah and so anyway yeah then then you get somewhere that's that's got a lot more going on it's like oh my gosh it's it's everywhere and and it was certainly available there and what's cool about the internet is it's available there as well in all sorts of different ways so that you can have access to it anywhere which is so cool so okay i we are gonna we'll get more to more of that stuff later but sure. i do want to just start doing the thing where we go back in time so let's get in our little time machine and let's back it on up so as you guys can tell what did we immediately go into recovery so matt is actively involved in recovery and comes from an addiction background himself and so i want to kind of have you give a bit of your story with that before you got into recovery yeah, yeah so uh that's so funny like time machine uh yeah so i'll start i got uh, I got sober in 2010, okay. May 17th. But uh, prior to that, uh, I was 28 years old when that all went down. But prior to that, it was, you know, small town, New York, um, you know, small school, public, like, you know, these little pockets and like call them shires if you want to. It feels like these like little small places in upstate New York. Again, only 30 minutes from the city. But what'd you do? You know, you, you know, you played sports, you hung out, you drank in cul-de-sacs, you had fun, um, you went to house parties, there's basements in new york which is not a thing in, in florida mm -hmm. Are they, is that a thing in austin are there basements here no no right okay um and and it was just like one of those things where it just eventually you know most people kind of grow out of a phase or whatever they're doing and my level of addiction or a desire to feel different um kind of carried me to a different place so a lot of people that were drinking normally or moving on or growing up or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. um didn't really apply to me. So I'd always be very busy and I'd fill my time kind of with, you know, not allowing myself to, <laughs> to kind of let loose. So it was, I was a teacher, I was a coach, I was a mentor. Um, and then I would work in the restaurant industry, which is kind of like allowed me to do that with other people that did it like I did. Sure. Um, you know, you know, you work in a kitchen or you work as a bartender or any of those things. Mm -hmm. If you're good with the kitchen staff, like, you're getting taken care of mm -hmm. and like you're hanging out and like you have access to pretty much anything if they liked you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that kind of, I, I don't know when I crossed over the point of where I couldn't stop. Cause I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a daily drinker. I wasn't a daily user. I, I just kind of, you know, whenever I did, it was like, I couldn't stop. Um, and I'd have, you know, like the frothy emotional appeal, like, why can't you stop? Like, what are you doing? You have everything to live for. Why are you doing this? And like, you know, from parents and friends and I usually would just kind of like, Hey, thanks for caring. But, can I, can I, can I curse? Go for it. I just, I just making sure if I did, I just make sure, but I'd be like F off. Like, you know, like I work hard, I do this, 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 this. And I'm, you know, if I overserve myself, um, but the over serving kind of led to a point where, um, there was a lot of consequences. I was the consequence guy, you know, uh, I crash a car, um, end up in a drunk tank, end up in the back of a cop car. And again, not from being like angry and fighting and doing things that, you know, I wasn't like a rageaholic, but like, I just would drink to the point of if we were you know sitting in here and we were drinking for hours i'd be fine the minute i left here my environment would change i'd black out mm. and it would be I, I, and then i wouldn't you know i'd i'd, <laughs> I'd end up you know i've woken up in bushes i've woken up in like random porches and random places where i'm like how did i get here mm -hmm. um you know where's my car like dude where's my car like that was serious for mm -hmm. me and it was uh and, and and i didn't think anything was wrong with that i thought everybody was doing that but then like people were like 
getting married and having kids and being lawyers and doing things. And I was drinking with people younger and younger and younger. And even then it was kind of like, yeah, dude, you're, you're, you're kind of a, kind of a mess. Mm -hmm. and, and you're kind of a uh, scary and how you get, cause I would go to that like complete, like I called it like the zombie status where like I would glaze over and I'd just be sitting there mm -hmm. and like, I wouldn't, I'd just kind of just be like, meh. You know, and mm -hmm. I would just keep consuming and consuming until like that was it. And I blacked out or passed out or whatever came of it. So, so let me ask you, why'd you do that? You know, after a lot of therapy and work on myself and, and doing that, you know, I honestly, I think there was, uh, I lived in a lot of fear. Um, I have, I, I have, I had, and still have outrageous expectations of myself, mm -hmm. um, and how things should be. I have you know, a very successful family and Every, you know, I used to blame things on that, you know, losing my dad at a young age, you know, my two brothers being very successful and very smart and um, just carried a lot of just like shame and guilt because like I didn't know once I figured I, I couldn't stop on my own. I was like, I would work really hard. And, you know, my mom would always say, she's like, you work really hard, you build everything up. And then like when one fell swoop, 24 to 48 to 36, 72 hours, I would destroy everything. Mm -hmm. And then I would rebuild mm -hmm. or try to and like, not really address the issue and, and the issue I, it was just a lot of fear right it was a lot of you know what am i what am like what am i doing mm -hmm. you know and i thought like by teaching and getting my masters and doing all these things and checklisting everything off that i would actually be you know you can't really talk to me about my my drinking or drugging because i was doing all these other things i was successful uh -huh. and uh it was just you know anytime anybody got too close or uh, you know, whether it was like I was dating somebody and, and like I let them too close or like the game, like I figured out that like I had achieved and like, oh, they're in, like I, like they're in, I would, I would be a complete and utter asshole and like shut down and completely be emotionally unavailable and completely just like push people away because I didn't want anybody to know what was going on. Mm -hmm. Like I was, at, you know, I had a drinking issue, a drinking situation, a drinking thing. And people like, I've had people be like, like, I always tell this story, or I just started telling this story because it was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I was a teacher and one of my co-teachers, we were young. There was a couple young teachers at school and I lived on a road with a, a friend of mine that we taught at the same school and like she grew up there and her mom lived a couple houses down. And when like one day on the street, I was like, oh, it's your mom, it's nice to meet you. How are you doing? She's like, oh, you're the alcoholic. Oof. And I was like, I looked at my friend and I was like, what like what like I almost was like I almost like was super disrespectful be like what the fuck did you just say to me mm -hmm. but it was like her mom and I was like yeah yeah uh, I was like cool nice to meet you and I kept it going yeah but like she knew me and it's like people that knew me or saw right through me I was like I had no time for that because mm -hmm. I didn't want to I wasn't ready mm -hmm. um, so yeah I spent a lot of time working really hard spinning my wheels um, building things up tearing them down um, until enough was enough and like I got sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. And that was like a, a great realization in jail. <laughs> Not a fun place to be in, in, in South Florida, especially gun club. Uh, when, you know, again, I say this, like you look like me cause I was definitely the minority there and it was definitely one of the scariest fucking times I've ever had. Yeah. Fear will do things for you. That's it's, uh, I gave a talk on fear last night, actually. So oh, this is sweet. quite interesting that, that you're saying that. I mean, obviously, I, I agree um, that. And so in talking through that last night, it was it was kind of walking through for me of all of this fear that, that what, what I was talking about in this situation was that, um, you know, fear drove my actions and I wasn't having conversations about that reality. I didn't know that that's what was going on. Whereas now we have this awareness that that was. And and then here's this cute little detail called, I'm almost two years sober, you're 20, you're, I'm I sorry, wish. you're four, <laughs> I'm coming 13, up on 13, yeah. 13, almost 13 years sober. And you still experience fear. Oh yeah. And so I think that's an interesting thing that like, you finally identify like, oh, so many of my actions were driven by fear while I was out, you know, partying and, and over overshooting the mark. Um, and then I got sober and I still had a lot of fear <laughs> and now I'm aware of it. Yeah. And so at least you've got, you know, some action steps you've probably been taught to like deal with that, but just 
understanding that that dictated, you know, that was one of the the fears I had of, of getting sober was one. I didn't know if I was capable of doing it. Mm. So it was really scary because I felt like absolute desperation to do it and terrified I wouldn't be able to, but I was that, also, I ahead. think that's a great, that's a great point. You said it and like that, at that desperation point, mm -hmm. that bottom, right? Cause like you can bottom out how many times, right? And I, I bottomed out a lot, mm -hmm. but never was really ready until I was like desperate enough because nothing worked. Mm -hmm. Like no amount of booze or drugs or uh, success, anything, mm -hmm. success, failure, whatever was, was going to change. It was the desperate feeling of like, I don't want to be on the face of the earth anymore. Mm hmm because there's no alternative, mm -hmm. I, or at least I didn't know of one. Right. Or I had like maybe been exposed to one, but I, I, I just didn't think it applied to me. So that's, I just wanted to say like, I love how you said that. Yeah, well, and I think also, you know, you look at your environment and, and this is just something that's just so real of if your environment is conducive, then the likelihood of you staying in that behavior is really, really good, you know? Mm -hmm. Versus if your environment says, you know, we can certainly look back at all these years of, of our experiences, pre-sobriety of all of these actions that we took that now that we, you know, I, like I reflect back on many things that behaviors I had and so on. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, hey, that's, that's bad. Yeah. That's not okay. And yeah. maybe they're egregious, like the terrible, awful ones, you know, coming out of a blackout while you're, you know, in a drive through or, or there's a number of different ones that you're like, I don't mean to laugh at that, but yeah. Yeah. I mean like being asleep in the middle of the day is not like a good thing whenever, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a bad deal. Oh, we could man. go through a handful that are like really obviously like obviously bad, right. but what, but I mean, there's all these sneaky little ones too. Yeah. And, and the way that you interact with people, you know, is it, is it because you are operating out of fear and needing them to love you and maybe you're overstepping your self-respect boundaries and, you know what I mean? Like it can get really like micro nuanced. You can be unaware of it until you start to wake up to a, the behaviors. It's a manipulation. And that's, Go further. How, and, and that, and that for me was, and I wasn't raised as well. My parents are amazing, like, you know, amazing folks, like great family. Mm. I've heard some tragic stories out there. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I don't know how I learned this, but it was like, I would, I would first identify if like that person like was like, okay, they have an issue with me drinking and drugging. Like, are we going to be on the same page? And if not, I'd be like, how is this person going to do what I need them to do? Mm -hmm. And never taking into consideration that they were a human being and they had feelings and thoughts and everything, but also knowing that like what I was doing was wrong and I felt so guilty and bad about it mm -hmm. because I was like, I don't know, like trained and like, Oh, I went to, you know, got like psychology and this and that. And it's like, how do I crawl into somebody, use them and just, just, just kind of leave them off to the side. And I wasn't raised that way. And like, that's like where my addiction got me mm -hmm. where it's like, that's just a terrible place to be. It's an awful place to be. Absolutely. Like, yeah. like that's not, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm, I'm a taker, right? I'm going to take what I need from you and I'm going to leave you to the side. And hopefully you don't find out who I am. And if you do, uh, hopefully you don't tell anybody about it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's like even more isolating than drinking and drugging by yourself, mm -hmm. which is how, how I ended, you know, because I didn't want anybody to see who I, you know, it's like, I didn't, you know, like if you really saw, and like, I remember like when I was getting sober, like my two older brothers were like, oh, I want to support you. I want to be here. I was like, I appreciate that. I was like, but I'm going to go talk about some really like, like, like when the, when the, when finally I was able to like get all this stuff out, mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know if you want to sit in on this because I'm like interviewing treatment centers and like talking to people to see if I'm a good, if they're a good fit for me to go to mm -hmm. like, still holding on to that ego and like, sure. oh, I'm in control. Yeah. And one of my brothers walked out of there like white as a ghost, and he goes, I "I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm really sorry. I didn't know how bad." And I was like, "Yeah, I'm sorry. You just wanted to be there for that." Yeah. You know, and and again, I don't want to jump the gun, but like, it's it's people that don't get it or have lived it. And again, I've heard some really tragic stories from childhood and things that people have gone through, and like, again, I take my problems back that I think are problems mm -hmm. um, after hearing some things being around a little, mm -hmm. a little bit, but like, yeah, just like, it's just, it's, it's tragic. Mm -hmm. right? And it's, you know, there's, I'm sure, I mean, you've been around, but you, you've been around for a bit 
and like the people that aren't here anymore mm -hmm. that like can't do this and mm -hmm. can't have a conversation about awareness manipulation you know not not remembering where who or how they got somewhere mm -hmm. um, brutal yeah well, and you being able to, I mean, either anybody being able to openly admit, like being able to look back at those experiences and say, I was literally getting out of you what I could, like those are things that require a ton of humility for you at this point to like acknowledge that those are actions that you took and without awareness, you could take those actions again, yeah. Yeah. you know? Um, I think that I was listening to the Modern Wisdom podcast, Chris Williamson, uh, does an amazing job with that. And he had Alex Hormozy on as a guest this week. And one of the, I, be, I believe it was this episode that, that I'm referring to. I sure don't want to be wrong there, but I think this was it anyway. And Alex was making a comment about the difference between poverty and being out, like being in poverty and being out of poverty and just wait, cause I'm going to tie this together. Hopefully, <laughs> um, being able to use the words, my fault. So he was referring to financial po poverty, right? Like living in poverty or not. And, and saying that to get out of poverty, you know, if you're living in it, then you may not be able to operate with that my fault mentality versus being out of it, being able to operate with the my fault mentality. So I take and apply that to recovery or to literally any other detail of life. And, and this is probably very relatable for you, but it is 100% the case for me that like the point in which I decided to get sober was the moment in which I had created a monumental mess. Uh, uh, one that was larger than many, many other ones that I had created that for some reason, well, I was blacked out. Well, I just don't remember it. I don't know, you know, whatever, not taking agency. Mm. And yet again, if we look at my environment, it wasn't one going clear. What are you doing? And so it's, I, I don't, there's no individual to blame for that. But then to finally, thankfully, have the opportunity to finally, in this event, monumentally bad, go, oh, whether I was blacked out or not, uh, that was my fault. Huh. Mm. Yeah. If I would have kept my brain inside my head, maybe I wouldn't have been in that room around those people and done that thing. And I did that. I did that. Taking ownership of that changed my life. Mm. Right? Perfectly said. So then we can apply that to business. We can apply that to our financial well-being. We can apply that to the way that we interact with the people that we love. We can sprinkle that all over all aspects of life. And when we're able to finally recognize we always have a role, it is empowering as Fuck. <laughs> so, okay. I want to, because I think that we're going to get in further to more of the, like the comeback, but, but I think one of the things I, that's really cool about you to me is you are a comeback story. You are a story of resilience. You have now built a brand that's doing super well and you've done a bunch of different business ventures. Like you're, you're doing cool things, purpose driven things. So, but we're not going to get there just yet, but that's, that's the story we're telling. So, when did you recognize this was like, let's go to that moment when you're finally in, you know, going to the recovery centers and going, Oh shit. Mm. Okay. Maybe I got, I got to do something about this. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would say that the, I had an, uh, an earlier incident led me to, um, uh, it led me to a place where like I heard other people talking and I was still young and I was like, I'm nothing like these fucking people. I was like, y'all got some problems. Mm. Um, and I would say, you know, seven years later I was there and worse. And finally, um, you know, as a teacher and, and a coach and, and doing these things and another incident going down and just like being at the point where I was just like, again, sick and tired of sick and tired. I kind of remember, you know, the, the, the DUI and kind of just, I didn't run. I didn't try. I just sat on the side of the road, waited to be arrested and like was hauled off. And even in there, I was just like, you know, when I kind of came to and like, kind of you know it's like I always say it's like you ever have that you know feeling where your eyes are closed and you're about to wake up and like now it feels good but like back then you're like you hear things you're like please 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 and this is where it's like please God or please universe or please whatever please don't let me be where I think I am and it's like waking up in an orange jumpsuit you know 
dried tears and snot like the big tough guy that I never was mm -hmm. and just being like I'm just sick and tired I need help I need, I'm sick and tired of sick, being sick and tired and then things kind of happening and not being like patting myself oh I did that I'm out of this but like fully going to that place where you know everybody knew what happened it was right down the street from where I was working it was stopping traffic on both sides it was very public Mm -hmm. And I had had public things like go on before, but like nothing like, you know, like little hand slaps and like things that were, you know, oh God, like how did you get yourself into that and how are you going to get yourself out? But that point in time where um, one of my students, fathers, mothers, I should say, it's like, you should call my husband. And I was like, no fucking way. He was a scary guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, big Long Island guy down in Florida. Just kind of, he was like, he was one of those dudes that like, I knew he knew who I was, but like, I didn't know much about him cause he was never around that much. But you know, when I called him, he picked me up and he, and he, and he brought me, you know, brought me to a meeting. And I remember kind of just sitting there, just kind of like looking at people mm -hmm. and being so furious that they were happy and high-fiving and hugging and drinking coffee. And like, I just kind of was just like, you know, arms folded, just kind of like, fuck these people and like, what do they know? And, and he, and he made me share like who I was. I was like, and, and I had said I was an alcoholic and I said it in a group of people and you know, as I'm, and, and I, I kind of like vomited on the meeting and like, I love my job and, and this is happening. I'm going to go to jail for one to three years. And I, I don't know what's going to go on. And everybody was just like nodding and smiling, which <laughs> fucking pissed me off. <laughs> and then a guy got up and he goes, or uh, raised his hand, he goes, after I was done, the guy was like, oh, I, he's like, so-and-so, I'm blah, blah, blah. He's like, I remember when I was like you, you're a scared little boy. And I was like, you mother. And, but he was right. Yeah. And I remember everyone shared on their beginning. And like, I don't want to get emotional, but like it meant something to me. I was like, oh, these people get it. Yeah. They're not like, you idiot. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Mm-hmm. And I felt like, oh, these, this is my, these people get it. Mm -hmm. Weird. Mm -hmm. And then like the, everything ended and then I was like, cool. And they're like, How, are you coming tomorrow? And I was like, oh, like, didn't you listen? I don't have a car. And like, yeah, I'm a little busy. Yeah, I just like, I don't have a car. I don't do this. And they're like, well, that person's going to take you home. This person's going to pick you up. Do you, do you want to come give some meat? I was like, I have no money. And they're like, no, no, no. Like people just were like, hey, come back. Mm -hmm. Hey, if you need anything. Here's a list of people you can call mm -hmm. um, if you're struck. And I'm just like, okay, you know, kind of like what, like what's in it for you? Mm -hmm. That's where I was. And like, mm -hmm. I didn't, again, I wasn't raised that way. Yeah. But I was like, based off my manipulation and how I did things, I was like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. What's going, what's like really going on here? Yeah. Like, I don't have anything. For you. Yeah. What's your angle? Yeah. I have nothing for you. Mm -hmm. If you, d if you really listen, yeah, I have no car. I, I have no job. I, I'm, I'm going to jail. I, yeah. I got nothing. Yeah. And they're just like, yeah, just, we hope to see you tomorrow. I think one of the things I, I like to bring awareness back to with addiction and alcoholism and things like that is um, individuals who are suffering from these illnesses, uh, they never set out to do that. And I think that that's something that if you haven't struggled with that, I truly love that for you. <laughs> like I do. Um, I think it's so wonderful that not everyone has to do that thing, mm. but I do always like to just kind of bring some awareness to the reality that no one ever set out with the intention of I'm going to be an addict, yeah. you know, I'm, like, yeah. I'm going to fucking blow my life up. Right. It's going to yeah. be amazing. I can't wait to wake up in a jumpsuit. Mm. Uh, that's orange. And so I just like to, to make sure that, that these humans are suffering from things that are causing them to behave these ways, which of course we, we've got to figure out what to do about this mm. so that, that they can live, you know, which thankfully there are solutions out there. But uh, I don't know. I just kind of like to touch on that too, yeah. because if you, if you haven't struggled with it, it can be really hard to understand how could someone ever do those things. And I so get it with your brain inside your head, as I like to say, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> like nothing about that makes any sense and that's okay. It shouldn't make sense. It's a, it's literally, but pulls, that's the thing about the illness, right? It literally pulls or turns you away from like your true purpose of like why you're here. Yeah. And that's like, and then it's like, well, well, why am I here? And it's like, if I can get through that shame and embarrassment and like the first three years of sobriety for me, I was still very, I was like, you know, you know, really dark, 
Like I've, I, the crazy thing is, is I've journaled every day since that accident. May, so the accident was May 15th. I, I feel like things finally left my system in May 17th, 2010. And I remember going back to work and everybody was like, you know, like, oh, it's Mr. Williams. you know, and like, I knew everybody was not like my ego, but like, I knew they were talking about the fact that I had totaled my car down the street from my, op, where I worked, everyone in the school knew. And I became, like, I was like, Hey, Mr. Williams is a good guy. Coach, blah, 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 to like literal words out of one. And this, this will stick with me because it sounds like a resentment, but it's, I will never forget it. Mm-hmm. One of the mothers was like, he's a scumbag, loser, douchebag. I will never forget those words. I'll never forget that I had bad eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> Among a plethora uh-huh. of other things. <laughs> um, <laughs> there but, were other worse ones, but anyway. <laughs> but it was one of those things. And I remember addressing that issue with um, with the headmaster. And he's like, oh, you know, Mr. Williams, you know, he's like, you're a young man, you know, so, you know, you know, have a DUI. And I was like, no, man, like, understand this. This is not my first go round. And like, this is a game changer. So I need you to understand that like, even though I'm not coming and like, I was, I was literally, I had the perfect setup. I was like 28 driving a Jeep, a Jeep soft top, like, like everything that could have gone like scripted I had. And I didn't, I hate saying this now, but like, cause I thought it was everything. I didn't fucking care or appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And like the school, the community, everything. I was like, no, I want to go back to, New York, I, I like, I want to go back to Stanford. I want to work in the city and I want to, it was like that triangle of terror. And then when I feel bad, I'm going to go visit my mom. So like, like, you know, I feel like I'm a good guy. Tell me what that triangle of terror is. Stanford, Connecticut. Okay. Briar, Ossining, New York. Okay. New York city. Okay. So if I like did some damage here, uh-huh. I would go here. Okay. And then if I did some damage here with like my, like friends that are still around and like adults, I would, you know, I'm going to go here. Okay. The problem with like the triangle of terror is eventually you come back to that point uh-huh. where people are like, Hey dude, the last time you were here, it you were bad. a fucking nightmare. Mm-hmm. Please don't come back mm-hmm. here. Or, and I would find someone else mm-hmm. to do something with. Yeah. And like I opted out of, I'm not going to resign my contract or teaching. And like, they were furious because when you sign something and you go, it's like, you're trying to, you're kind of committing for like a couple of years because they're building a teacher and a community in this. And I was just like, you guys, I'm out. Mm-hmm. I want what I want. And then when all of this came down, they're like, well, we already rehired a teacher and like, we think you're great, but like, bye. Good luck. And I was like, man. Mm. And, and it was, and, and, and there were some really, really like people that were like very important in that time. One of my, you know, my, I, the guy, the, the dad that took me to a meeting and another woman who I, who they were just very nice to me. Mm-hmm. And then I found out like, not why that's who she was, but she was like, you know, I'm 23 years sober. And she's like, you made a decision before this happened. Now you need to acknowledge it, be aware of it, and then take action on it because you're not supposed to be a teacher here. This is what brought you down here. And now how you build your life, that, that is what's going to define who you are and how you do this. And I was like, fuck, like, I don't know what that looks like. She goes, well, that's the, that's the best part. Mm. She goes, you can, get sober and build a life that you're meant to or continue to do what you're doing mm-hmm. and have this repeated conversation with somebody that loves and cares about you until you're no longer on the planet. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I love her. Nor, nor is a great lady. Nor I love you. Nor is a great lady. So you said the first three years dark, right. dark. So I want to talk about, Kind of briefly. Yeah. I do want to talk about what Changing my were, here. <laughs> yeah, these chairs, guys, for anyone that's not watching, they're deep and it becomes this interesting navigation of <laughs> yeah. like, where do I want to be right now? Um, yeah. And I noticed this is a trend with podcasts too. We like a lot of podcasts have these like deep chairs that it's just kind of like people are just fidgeting around in them a lot. Um, okay. First few years of sobriety, struggle. Just kind of touch on what were some of the things that made it so hard in that the early stages of sobriety what were some of the challenges that you faced shame and embarrassment um i, I just thought like I, I i thought i was a loser you know i compared myself to a lot of other people um which i didn't need to do and no one told me like i just naturally that's how my brain went um and like you know i, I tried other things like i will do 
like like drugs and alcohol. I'll do anything once, and if I like it, I'll do it more than once. Mm-hmm. But I, I remember I went to like a Tony Robbins seminar because I was working and like ex- had the access to it. And I I remember during the whole Dickens process, at like two and a half years sober, I was bent over, crying like sucking air in because I couldn't stop crying because I was still in that pattern of like negativity and how I thought of myself in the world. And like, it blew my mind. And I'm like, how do I really feel like this? And like, mm-hmm. am I, am I acknowledging? Cause I've done a lot of work on myself with therapy and treatment and, and meetings and, 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 and conversations. And I'm like, and they're like, well, that you're a human being. And like, you have years of just complete darkness that you never acknowledged. So those first three years and a lot of things coming out of that, like, again, like I don't, there's not a lot of dark days for me, like maybe one or two where I, where I like completely go down the rabbit hole and like, there's like a, it's like a 10 hour depression of, and I don't know why it just, it, it'll happen and I, I'll indulge in it uh. rather than use the tools. Right. Yeah. And, um, but that early sobriety is really hard. And I think, you know, again, it's, you know, you're, you're in it and like, talking to you and just getting to know you, uh, you know, in the last couple of months, I'm like, it's fucking phenomenal to, to, to watch you do it because like, I don't, you know, again, like I wasn't there at, 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 at the beginning. I want, I wish I was, mm-hmm. but like, that's not, that wasn't my journey. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's that it's like, what do you, it's, you know, I, I, I feel like I say these stories all the time and it's, again, it was another student's father that like sat me down. He's like, yeah, you know, like he hired me and he goes, can you just tell me what, like, what's going on? Like, why didn't you go back? And I told my whole story and he looked at me, he goes, you know what, Matt? No one fucking cares. (laughs) And I was like, mouth open. I was like, what? He goes, no, no, no. He's like, listen to me. He goes, no one fucking cares in the nicest way because everybody's so preoccupied with their own shit. He's like, what are you going to do about it? I was like, well, I am doing stuff. He goes, yeah, no, I, I understand that. He's like, but like that story is your story. And like, I had another person or two over the time and I'm like, well, that's my story. And they're like, yeah, but like, why don't you talk about the things that are going on now? And I'm like, well, it's not, it's, you know, it's, it's what, it's what, well, it's not that, you know, it's like, it's not that exciting. They're like, you, you really like, and this is where, you know, when I talk to you or I call my, I guess I'm say my sponsor, mm. um, he would be like, dude, let's go back 12 years. Do you remember when you were driving home or not, sorry, not driving home, but getting driven home and you wanted to kill yourself on Clintmore road. Do you remember that? I'm like, dude, I know where you're going. He goes, no, no, no. I need you to remember it because you are literally being, you know, a li- like, mm. again, you're, you're being a little bitch. Yeah. And he goes, I'm listening to you, but he's like, there's a lot going on right now. And there's a lot that you've done. And like, just thank God, keep it moving. And, and like, again, like celebrate it. Yeah. You know, be, be here. You know? Yeah. It's, it's hard. <laughs> Everyone being so preoccupied with themselves. It's, it's so true. Um, I remember around a year of sobriety, um, I, an event occurred and, and I was around all of these people that were aware of the event that got me sober. And then they were aware that I had gotten sober. And by now I'm a year in. So, you guys know how hard I've been working, right? So anyway, I know where it's going. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> so a thing yeah. happens in front of the, I just, I got injured in the gym. I got injured. Right. And, and so I was so upset with how I felt like no one cared mm. and everyone is so preoccupied with themselves, including me. You know, so I remember speaking to a friend in sobriety after that and being like, I'm just so sad that I feel like they like they all know I've been trying so hard and they know. And he was like, sweetie, ain't nobody paying attention. They have no idea what you've been doing. So you need to just get on, keep doing, move along. You know, like, just like you said, when you got sober, living for them, living for them was broken. Well, Ooh. it's still broken. Yeah. Yeah. So their approval that you were so desperate for that you stopped getting, like, we're not working for that again, are we? 
you know, and that's a yicky yucky one because we can look at that at all stages of life, sobered, yeah. whatever, you know. So I, I know we're spending a lot of energy on that in this because that's our stories. Sure. But uh, but that's also just for anybody, you know, living for everyone else's approval and in the reality that uh, that will never leave leave us fulfilled mm. ever. Ever. So, okay. So you've begun to build a beautiful life now. Appreciate that. Yes, you have. And I don't, I, we just met in January and it's now April. So we met not that long ago. Um, I have become an avid multiple subscription to your mm -hmm. <laughs> bars. They get that. delivered to my month or to my house, um, multiple boxes per month. Uh, so I do want to talk about, cause I think one thing that's so cool too, is, you know, like going down this path is like addressing how nasty things had to be to get you to a place where you took agency mm -hmm. and where then you went to a place where people had tools and skills that you could pick up and use. And they, there was a support system that was present to you. That's still present and actively a part of your life today, which is so cool and obviously relatable for me. Um, but there's more to your life than just, I got sober. Right. Period. Sure. No. No, you got sober and it was rough and it was tough for a while. I do want to ask you before we pivot on to the building that's now occurred. I do want to ask you, what is something that you would say to someone right now that is actively struggling with their own form of addiction? Like just coming around to like looking at different ways to get sober? They are actively in struggle with it. So they, you know, whether they in are out and out drinking in out and out, they've never yeah. even come in. They're simply looking at their behaviors going, shit, this isn't it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think like the biggest thing with that is, is, and it's so hard is to, to get honest with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, I hate saying this because like it was said to me, it's like, Hey, if you're not done, like, you know, you can learn about a lot of stuff here, but like, you know, go f go get done mm -hmm. I, and I hate I hate I, I hated hearing it mm -hmm. but like it was one of those things it's like there's a lot of people that are here and like you know I'm sure you've you've met you know, a lot of people along your travels where it's just like hey we're here to help but like I can't get you sober mm -hmm. no one can get you sober and like you have to have like hit a bottom and and for me again I, I address it I've heard I heard stories where it's just like a little thing right and like that's their bottom I'm like wow I wish I that could have been mine but it's not my story but it's right. like Emotionally, physically, you know, spiritually, financially, uh, like everything for me had to be on the bottom for me to be like, okay, what do you got? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of ways to get sober that are that are out there mm -hmm. and, and that work for people. And like, God bless, mm -hmm. you know, I know it works for me. I don't debate it. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, if I can be of service in a channel to helping, awesome. Um, but like the way I got sober is not for everybody. Um, and for, for, for a lot of people it is, mm -hmm. um, but people that are still struggling, I think it's, it's, again, it's like kind of, it's, I, I wasn't ready to listen to it. So I, I want to say like, Hey, come around. Cause like I did sample it years prior uh -huh. and I was like, fuck this, this isn't for me uh -huh. until it was. Uh -huh. So it's like really hard to like tell people, but like there, I will say this, there are a lot of people that care. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that care. Um, there are a lot of people that can honestly know how you feel and can identify with that whether you believe it or not mm -hmm. and just to give that a chance i'm not saying stop what you're doing because <laughs> hopefully there's a situation that'll cause you to stop or like give you a reason to like take a break to where you can hear but there are a lot of people and i didn't believe it there are a lot of people that care and that know exactly who you are what you're feeling and have been through it and are on the other side of it mm -hmm. so that's what i would tell those people it's good. That's good. The moment you can articulate it. I mean, it's even something that I talk about with friends and, and I now coach people with nutrition and so on. And so that's also an addiction mm. food. Um, and, and so that's something that we talk about there too, is like, as soon as you can openly articulate to me or to whoever, right. As, as soon as you can openly speak to somebody about the thing that you're struggling with. And so maybe it's not food. Maybe it is a relationship with your sure. parent or whatever. Right. The moment that we can breathe, like say it to another human, like all of the sudden we've taken the air out of it. Like it no longer holds the power that it once held. And now we have the Diminishes opportunity it. to get perspective and that's just absolutely transformative. So, okay. Yeah. So fro pro. <laughs> What's that? Fro pro, uh, frozen protein. 
and, and, and it's again, not unique to the name, but, uh, it was literally an idea. I was sitting, um, you know, I was trying to figure out some things in early sobriety and I was working in an office and, you know, it was one of those things where I had some time and I, I again, I had right out of treatment, um, dabbled with, um, food prep and making some stuff like for someone I met in treatment and didn't work out. And I'm not by no means a chef, but, uh, literally just started throwing things around cause I was biking and cycling, <laughs> not by choice around South Florida to get places. And in South Florida, you pack a bag, you wrap that bag in some plastic, put it in a book bag, and then you travel around and like, because it rains and it, and then it gets hot and whatever, but traveling around, like having some form of something to eat. Like I can't pack a tuna sandwich in South Florida and expect it to like last, you know, I'm mm -hmm. a tuna guy. Like I, I, I love food, but like, I just started making this bar and I'm like, cause I couldn't afford anything else. And I literally had some protein powder. I had some peanut butter and I had a couple of things that I threw together and just like made and like off I went. And, uh, yeah, it ended up just kind of like sharing with people and I was like getting my, my, my shit together. So it was an idea in 2011 and I shared it, you know, as a, some families were super cool. They're like, Hey, like mentor our kids, tutor our kids. They love you. Train them, like come over two hours through whatever it is. And, uh, yeah, I just kind of shared it with, you know, some people and they're like, this is really good. What do you call it? And I'm like, I don't know. It's like frozen protein for pro. And one of these moms was like in PR and marketing, sat me down and like bought domains. And I was like, I don't know what that is, you yeah. know? And, uh, she just said, you should share this with people. This is really good. And I was like, cool. I don't really know what you're fucking talking about, but like, sounds cool. And I just started sharing this product with people. And again, like I didn't create it, you know, I didn't create it other than it was for me selfishly. Mm -hmm. It was like, I needed something to eat. Mm -hmm. I like to eat. And, um, my friends opened their gym and I said, Hey, I'd like to be a trainer and like kind of maybe enter into that field again and like come back into that. I started teaching class and started sharing the product there without them knowing whose product it was. Cause I was like, again, first three years, I was like, Oh God, if no one likes this, I'm going to feel like such a loser and a failure. And I remember like people were like, like they would eat it and be like, yeah, you know, like this, Oh my God, you try this, you know? <laughs> and one lady was like, well, I want to try this. And like asking the guys questions that are in the gym and like, they like kind of looked over me and I was like, okay. And like, she's like, Hey, so what's in it? And I told her, she's like, I'd really like to eat it. But like at that time I was using like whey protein and like basics. She goes, well, you know, I plant-based and she started explaining things to me. And I was like, okay. And I was like, well, I'll try it. And I tried it and I brought it to her. She's like, this is really good. She's like, can you make me a hundred? And I was like, uh, no, I don't know. <laughs> and she was like, well, I have it. This is before juice bars were big. She was like, well, I have a juice bar in East Boca. Make me a hundred wrap them and bring them to me. And when you do, we'll figure it out. So of course I'm like, I ran home, I'm like dating, you know, the girl I'm dating. I was like, Hey, tell us like, you know, like what, like I got to make a hundred of these. She's like, okay. Like she wasn't really involved and she's like, cool. Like, great. Like do that. Yeah. Brought this hundred bars to this, this, this gal. And I was like, Hey, uh, here's a hundred bars. And she's like, well, how much did it cost you to make? I was like, I have no clue. <laughs> and she's just like, all right, cool. So here's what I'm going to sell them for. This is what I'm going to pay you when I sell them. And I'm like, uh, oh, okay, cool. And like, I had friends that were lawyers and like, <laughs> I even like went in there with like a couple pages of things. Like, do I, do I, like, I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, do I give you this paperwork? And she kind of like laughed at me. She's like, Matt, like, I'm just trying to help you out. Like, this is called consignment. I'm not paying you anything until I sell them. I'm like, oh, oh okay. Like, thanks. And I like ran away. Cause I was like, I don't want this to like, her to change her mind. Uh huh. And three days later, she's like, Hey, I sold out of all your bars. Can you make me another hundred? And I was like, for, for real? And I like walked in and she like handed me a check and I was like, she's like, yeah, I put them right at, right at checkout and people love them. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. And I made her a hundred and then she's like, oh, here, call my friend. She's opening one in, in Delray beach. And I was like, okay. Called her friend. Yeah, we'll take 25. I was like, okay. So again, I don't know shit about shit when it comes to that stuff. And mm -hmm. I wrote things down in a notebook with pencil mm -hmm. and that was the start of, you know, fro pro snack bars and in, in like glad press and seal wrap with like a white, sticker on it i love it isn't that crazy that's so cool and also you said that you started this endeavor in 2011 idea yeah the idea you started making them at home just for yourself whatever yeah. and in the first couple months i i realized if i wanted like in florida there's a cottage act which because there's so many green markets because like it's nice there year round so it's like if you want to be sold in those you just have to say i make these at home which is like people are totally chill about that and i was like i feel weird
mm. that people know I'm making home. And I had a friend that had a kitchen and he's like, off hours, here's what you pay me. You come in he's like, if it gets in the way, you're out. And I, and, and, and I learned a valuable lesson. That's another story for another time um, from that person. Mm-hmm. But I, I wanted to be legit to not have the cottage act thing on there. Mm-hmm. And I rented space and I was like, you know, like I didn't, <laughs> like I used to grind up things and someone's like, you know, you don't have to do that. You can buy that in a bag mixed. And I'm like, no, I did not know that. Thank you for telling me this mm-hmm. is going to save a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And like, I just learned the process and like made and, and, and met people that are still on our team to this day. But it was like the very beginning was like, I want this to be as legit as possible because again, I was afraid of fa- like that, that failure of like letting somebody down and like, not it not being like oh dude this is made in your home Mm. gross so this idea starts you start making these things at home in 2011 which by the way you got sober in 2010 so this is the next year which i think is something that's really cool to bring attention to is that your life can start to become really cool really fast even if it then so i want to draw attention to that it's also 2023 right now Hmm. 12 years after this idea started Mm -hmm. and You've undergone adversity. You just mentioned some sort of situation that should be its own story of it not going well. A couple of those along Mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. And so you started to do this thing that is now your primary business that you just felt fired up about. Like you liked the thing. And and then now all these years later, you're like, whether you knew it at the time, you... 12 years is a bit to be committed to something, anything, anything. And you were playing a long game and like you, like maybe, maybe unaware, but you were playing a long game because here you are today and they're sold in multiple States and they're all over the place. And I get them shipped to my house on subscription and there's marketing and it's good. And you know, I mean, so you've come a long way in those 12 years, but that was 12 years. And that's just another thing that I like to draw attention to. I had the beautiful opportunity this past week to do an event with Cody Sanchez. And um, she is just a powerhouse in business. And uh, two days prior to our event, she was on Andy Frisella's Real AF podcast, right? So she's no slouch. And I'm sure everybody listening already knows who she is. Yep. Uh, $50 $50 million in business in boring businesses annually, 20 million on multimedia annually, just for some quick stats about her. And one of the things she was talking about in that talk that she gave to fitness professionals in our area, which was such a cool thing to get to collaborate on, was she was talking to them about this like patience mm. in business and how if you're gonna commit to do this thing, Make sure like you love that thing, mm-hmm. like you're into it. And then understand that not only do you need to work your ass off with a sense of urgency and you need to be abundantly patient. Mm-hmm. And so I am paraphrasing what she was saying, but it was such a cool thing and certainly has been on my mind with whatever I'm up to over here. And then when I hear these stories such as yours is it's like, you know, you have probably worked really hard on this project and overcome a lot of adversity but you didn't give up and you're 12 years in and it's growing. Mm. It's uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's crazy to think about. And it, you know, it, it <laughs> it's one of those things where I've had a lot of, a lot of really good people behind me and like, mm. <laughs> um, like a really good community. Um, and what's great about that is knowing like, I could never do this myself and never have, um, I have an amazing wife. <laughs> who runs the business is why I'm allowed to be sitting here right now. I can't wait to meet her. <laughs> yeah, you guys, <laughs> you guys are, are very strong women. Um, but what's crazy about that is like the very beginning, um, someone said to me, like, you're in the effort business. And as long as you put forth effort into everything you're doing each day, and you can put your head down and know that you've done that, like it's a successful day. And that, that always stuck with me. I love that. Yeah. And like, um, it's crazy to think that we're at where we are today, but it still feels like we're just out at Expo West at a food show with thousands of brands, mm-hmm. thousands. And people are like, how long have you been doing this? And I'm like 10, technically 10 years. Cause it's a business in 2013. Mm-hmm. And they're like, Oh, like, wow, you've, you've done well. And like, 
why aren't you he you know it's like why aren't you here i'm like well um i didn't have a millions and millions of dollars behind it to grow and we're starting to you know it's like been a very slow process and a lot of the times in this cpg world it's have an idea you raise a shit ton of money right and like there's like I'm, I'm meeting with one of them the other day. They built an incredible business from college and they're three brothers. And it's just like, holy shit, they're everywhere. Do you mind disclosing what it is? Super coffee. Cool. And like, they're cool. Like, it's just a cool brand, uh -huh. three cool dudes. And again, it's like, wow, I, I hope to be there one day. And it's, it's again, everybody's journey is different. Yep. You know, it's like you, you go to Perfect Bar, RX Bar, any of these. Like, I didn't revolutionize bar. I just did something that I love. And you're right. If you don't love it, you're probably not going to want to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And I always believe at the very beginning, like when this whole thing happened and I like tried to make this at home and I had people like oh, refrigerated bar, like, dude, that's fucking stupid. And like, I'd always take people's like unsolicited opinions or people that I did solicit their opinions and be like, okay. But like deep down inside, there's like that divine inspiration of like, Hey, this is what you're supposed to be doing. So keep doing it regardless of what happens. It's really easy to let outside opinions uh, start to yeah. influence but like the, your decision. But weirdly making. enough, it never did because like I felt like it was spoken to me at a different level. Yeah. Right? Yep. And it's like, I say to my wife all the time, I was like, it would be really cool for this to be a nationwide brand. But if, we're, if we stay where we are and doing what we're doing, we have a really great life. Mm -hmm. And like we love each other. Mm -hmm. And like we have this great home that we love to be in. And like truly enjoy the process. And like, that's like, again, it sounds so corny, but that's like priceless. Absolutely. Because I was never at that point. And like, this has the, been the most honest relationship I've ever been in. And I told her to fucking run the other way because we were dating for a month when my life blew up. And I was like, you are young, beautiful, smart. Get out of here. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. And like she stuck, you know, like uh, she stuck around, and like that's like the craziest thing because, I, I, like, I feel bad saying this. I don't know if I would have stuck around for somebody, and like when when someone loves you and they see something in you that you don't see yourself, it's like I fucking won. I won. Yeah. That's it. Win. W. Done. Yeah. <laughs> She's a legend. Yeah. And this is where. There is certain growth that you won't get to experience unless someone else is a part of it. A hundred percent. And, and yeah. And, and I, again, like I said, like aside from her, there are a lot of other people that were just truly instrumental in sobriety in business. And like, you just got to ask those questions. Right. And you got to like put it out there. And, and if it's like a no, great. But like a lot of people, you know, I don't know. Again, it's just, just, it's like, there's just been a lot of people that have really, truly allowed me to grow mm -hmm. and, 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 and helped in the process without asking for anything. Mm. And like, I'll never forget that. And yeah. like, that's what I try to replicate for people. And it's like, you know, you see a lot of posts out there and like people are like, oh, can we grab a cup of coffee or can we do this? And it's like, oh, I don't have the time because I'm busy. But, and I get it. I said, but I have a buddy that's very successful and we were sitting down and we're talking and he's like, it sounds completely opposite to being successful, but he's like, I am grateful that I'm able to be available to people mm -hmm. and take phone calls. Mm -hmm. And like, I do, ma he does manage his time, but he said like, that's what was done for me. And he's not a sober guy and he's not a party or anything like that, but like he understands that. And I'm like blown away, but he understands <laughs> that and got there without having a tragedy in his life. <laughs> right. He's overcome stuff. Sure. But he said, being available and if people are seeking and asking your time within reason, mm -hmm. we are here to serve and, and, and be that servant leadership mm -hmm. and to be there to do that. That's why we're here. And I was always like, man, how do you know that? How did, you, how did you yeah how did you get that? how did you get there yeah you know um so yeah it's a it's been a it's it's a cool it's it's been and it is a really cool journey like i love this yeah you know like i love meeting cool people that mm -hmm. like you know like I've, i i don't want to say i've met somebody like you but like 
when you do, you know, mm -hmm. and you're like, man, this is a really fucking cool person. Mm -hmm. And I hope I get to spend some time with them and like get to know them truly. Mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot of bullshit out there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of um, just like, I don't even know what to, how to describe it. I don't want to go there because this has been fun. <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to round out. Yep. So thank you for disclosing everything that you disclosed here. The the ability to get into some of the weeds of some of the stuff is hard because it's not fun to have <laughs> ever been that person. Like, it's not like yeah. I loved the moments when I was an absolute dumpster fire and I was manipulative and all these like things. But what you've given people through being willing to open up about that is the opportunity to be a human too. And that's powerful because when I don't feel like you're going to judge me, I can actually be real and like the, we can get stuff done. Yeah. at that point you know so so thank you for doing that appreciate it for the opportunity yeah uh i do want to ask you what is something that you oh i do want to ask because you said this earlier so um what is your you mentioned this your sobriety routine you were talking about your morning routine oh you're right tell me what your morning routine is yeah so that uh, again for the most part a couple things just got added again but yeah for the most part it's uh i wake up i'm super four four thirty uh it's just like I go to sleep early, wake up early. Um, I go down. What does go to sleep early? Mm, 8.30. 8.30. Yeah. Like, okay. Latest, like, uh, like without pushing it, like, if we're, at, and again, I don't book dinners late, but like, you know, we're old, like. I support you. Okay. There's no justification. Yeah. Needed here. <laughs> yeah it's uh, a, <laughs> it's early dinner. Like it's still light out, which is kind of funny. Um, but yeah. Eric no. and I don't like to go to dinner after six. We would like to go to dinner oh, after six. Oh, sweet. All right. Oh, yeah. So we're good. Cause yeah. like sometimes like we get home from work and it's like five and like we're done and then yeah. we'll go for a walk. Make dinner. And, chill. Yeah, chill. Perfect. Yeah. So wake up in the morning. Um, yeah. Go downstairs uh, as to not, you know, wake up my wife uh, and like, you know, the coffee's brewing and everything. So I usually will breathe, meditate for like 15 to 20 minutes uh, and then I will pray. Uh, and again, prayer can be a host of things, something specific, a prayer I've remembered, but usually a prayer of gratitude, staying present, inviting like goodness into life into 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 me so i can be of service mm -hmm. um and then it's usually a reflection um i read something write something in between while doing that i'll be having my like morning drink uh, right now it's you know it's like we have all our friends that do like the brand stuff but it's like you know the element the ag1 colostrum amra mm -hmm. and then i'll kind of you know um, it's have, like you've been hanging out with Eric Henman or something. Henman, yeah. I mean, I mean, you want to talk about? I would man. say you want to talk about influence. That guy, he, he's a machine. Yep. Yeah, we, we all know this. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's like those things. Like those things I was doing, um, obviously, with different things until like brands that obviously like people recommend. I'm into that. Yeah. Um, and then it's yeah, I kind of do my other thing, and then I'm usually like out the door doing something um, physical, whether it's a walk, run, cycle, uh, workout, plunge, whatever that is. Uh, and then I kind of will do some form of uh, recovery, um, usually either talking to somebody, uh, attending some form of fellowship, um, because that's a great way for me to start my day and kind of get focused uh, in addition uh, to the readings and the stuff that I do. And again, that's just like the tools that were provided when I got sober mm -hmm. um, that I still, you know, if it works, like mm -hmm. you know, I don't need to change it. Mm -hmm. uh, my first, first sponsor, I say there's a lot of good ideas and we don't need any of yours. <laughs> Your ideas got you here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just sit down, shut up. Pretty much. <laughs> that was it. There's a God uh, and you aren't it. Oh, I got all yeah. those one liners like, that just like run through my head. I'm so like, good. Yeah. <laughs> that checks. Yeah. Okay. So what is something, wait, was that, did that cap it? The morning routine? Yeah. That's just like, yeah, that's the morning typically. And again, okay. like at any point in day, if I'm like struggling or like I go off like the beam, mm. I can like, I usually pull myself away and it's like, you know, I, I find a place to, to kind of get quiet and like try for a couple of minutes to like regroup. Yeah. Well, I think too, too, what's cool is, you know, reflection, anybody can do, you know, you know, and, and gratitude, anybody can do and prayer, anybody can do. And we should all be doing all of it. Yeah. Um, okay. What is something that you feel that you are doing well, that you would like to do better or do more of? Wow. <laughs> that I'd like to do more of. Um, I, you know, 
there was a lot of things going on before the Panini started, and um, <laughs> one of them being uh, getting back into the schools and talking and like working with like uh, you know working with kids. Like I remember back in the day, like being in school and like having those like school assemblies, like don't do drugs and don't drink, blah blah blah, and like it was corny as fuck. Uh, I think being really real with kids and like you know if I sp- I've spoken to in my community a lot of younger adults that like are struggling yep. and just being real with them and having a conversation. It's like, I'm not telling you to stop. I'm not telling you to do anything, but like, here's the result. Like I fully handed as a person that worked in treatment, I fully handed an envelope of dead kids to someone that asked for my help. And I told the parents, I'm not here to like belittle them. I'm not here to talk down to them. I'm just going to be really real. Like this is where you doing you in how you're operating in life is going to end up. Mm. And these kids range from like 17 to like 25 and like, it's a, it's like, I just like being real because no one I feel like dare and all those things are great. But like, if you're like a real, like budding alcoholic addict, you're like, fuck this. Mm-hmm. Like if, you know, like hit me with some real stuff. And mm-hmm. like when it's real, it's like, whoa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think I, I would like to do more of that. And like, that was kind of happening before that. The Panini, Panini. started and it was kind of just very like, man, you know, like I almost spoke at the school that I got the whole thing done with. Yeah. Like they invited me back to speak to the graduating class. Full circle. And then it it hit and I had to record it. And I was like, man, I really wish I was standing there talking to these kids that knew me back as Mr. Williams, fourth grade teacher that are now graduating. Mm. And like, and now they're like out of college and like human beings like living. (laughs) Yep. Well, and they, but you never know when they'll run across you. Right. And some have, and it's, 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 it's crazy. Yeah. Like it's crazy. Like, and like, and this is where it's like that, like little bit where like some of the parents I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Kids not doing too fucking hot now. Huh? Cool. What do you got to say about that? Oh, the poor Johnny's drinking and drugging. Oh, is he struggling? Oh, I remember a oh, scumbag loser douchebag. Right. Oh, right. 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 But like, yeah. Hey, I'm Judgment. glad I'm here for that. And like, mm-hmm. and again, like not, you know, knowing that, that I'm here for that reason of helping if I can. Yep. So I would like to do that, uh, that part more, uh, in terms of personal for Oprah, uh, you know, I'd love to be in all the places that we're trying to grow and like connecting with communities like this, uh, yep. here in Austin and like kind of up the coast and like telling the story and second chances and all that stuff. And, and really kind of sharing, like, that's can we say it's like, it's a peanut butter snack bar. It's a platform to like really connect more and like, hear people's stories and like do really cool things that like I once took for granted. Mm -hmm. You're going to do more of that. I hope so. So what are three things that you're grateful for? Wow. Uh, (laughs) In no particular order. Um, I'm grateful for uh, being a sober man connected with a higher power of my understanding. I'm grateful for my wife. Uh, and I'm grateful for connections with other human beings uh, and able to do doing things like this. All right. My three gratitudes, because I always say mine is I'm never well. sure if I'm, I'm allowed to ask questions to the person who's hosting. Oh. Because, like, sometimes I did that once, and they were like, this is my show. And I was like, oh, oh, sorry. In the nicest way, because, like, they didn't anticipate me firing questions back. When I get invited onto other people's podcasts, I fully flip it on them. Yeah, yeah. Like, so word, word, <laughs> just shout out to anyone that at a future time wants me to potentially come on your show. Just know. Oh, you're coming on the uh, Work at the Sun show and you're in Florida, of course. Okay, great. Know that I will start asking you questions too. I love that. I just, uh, yeah, being on that side of it, like it's, it, you have a role and it's great. And, and it really, that's what we want to do. But I'm like, but wait, can we have a conversation, please? Tell me something about you. Yeah. Um, okay. So three things that I'm grateful for today. I am grateful for books. Mm. I'm grateful for that platform to be able to expand your awareness through written words from people who have lived more life at different times than you. I am grateful for old friends. Mm. I uh, have been putting effort towards caring for relationships that when I left Oklahoma, I did not know how these relationships were going to fare over time. And as a result, I tried to turn a blind eye to some of it because I felt overwhelmed with what all I had to deal with and, and how do I maintain these relationships. And as a result, I hurt people. And, uh, and so 
doing work on that. And that's not like a new thing, but that's certainly something that's happened even over this last week of just taking the time to, to address those individuals and just say like, I'm aware that, that I've, I probably hurt you. And, um, that was never my intention. And if we can try to find a way to keep our friendship alive, I would enjoy that because I do care about you. Mm. And I just didn't really know what to do with all this, with all this new <sighs> and all this stuff, you know, I feel like you're speaking to someone specifically. Well, there, I mean, there's, it. and I love that. Yeah. There's a, one conversation I had in particular over the last week. Yeah. But then there, I mean, there have been multiple and that wasn't the first one and, and it's incredibly therapeutic. And then it's, what's the action afterwards too, of how do you actually what are you gonna do about follow it? up on that thing? And I don't have those answers. Thankfully, like I don't have to, I just have to care and try. You know, and uh, anyway, so grateful for that. Yeah. And, and, and they're, yeah, yeah, they're, I'm just grateful for those. And then I am also grateful for the awareness that comfort is actually the enemy. <laughs> yeah, I just, to know that like getting uncomfortable is like where I want to be hanging out a large portion of the time. And that if I feel too comfortable, then that's a good indicator that it's time to, to, Shake, Shake it up. It a up. Bit. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So grateful for that awareness. Okay. Where can the audience find you, support you? Awesome. Where to yeah. get them bars? Yes. You could go to FroPro Snacks on Instagram or Facebook or www.fropro.com or gofropro.com. Um, you can reach out to me at M W A R Williams, M Moore Williams on Instagram. Um, happy to connect on anything. Um, talk to anybody about life, sobriety business, uh, anything really. Um, we also a little shout out to our show, wake up the sun show on iTunes and, uh, hopefully we'll have you next time you're in the area or next time I come back, I'll bring all my stuff. Cause I'm a nomad when it comes to that. Yeah. You can also use this studio. Yeah. I was just going to say, we could do this too. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, like it's super easy to connect. Uh, you can find us. I know it's generic Matt Williams, but yeah, South Florida, mm -hmm. um, come visit. If you are in the Florida area, um, we'd love to have you work out, plunge, Try the bars, come visit the, the headquarters, uh, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And I always do shout this out too, and, I, and this may be weird, but I also tell people if, if you need anything or have a question, my cell phone, 914-772-6343. Easy to get a hold of me. Bold move. Love it. I love it. All right, guys. Thank you. If you are still hanging out, thank you to you yes, for everything you. that you've done for giving this time because your time is valuable and it means a lot that we get to share it here. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And if you, uh, if you got value out of this show, uh, all of, by the way, his details will be in the show notes. So yeah. you can go down there. If he said Mar Williams, whatever. And you were like, what is that? I don't know. Just go to the show notes. It'll be there. <laughs> so, cause trust me when I look him up, I'm like, Oh shit, what is it again? Yeah, <laughs> I know. I tried to, ch yeah, I got you. That's all right. So it'll be there. If you enjoyed this show and you feel like you got something valuable out of it, uh, my biggest ask is that you follow it, rate it, review it, and that you share it with somebody that you think it will positively impact. I'm extremely fired up about this podcast. Mm. I think that it has the capacity to do some real good. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to be here. And so other than that, we just hope that you have a beautiful day. Keep it triumphant. <laughs>